So when you have to employ fast 16th notes with one hand, what's the best way to do it? Do I just muscle them out? Do I use molar? Or maybe the push-pull technique? Well, in this video, we're gonna explore some of the different techniques that are available to you in a musical or practical situation when you're playing a groove. That's what's coming up next, so stay tuned. Now before we get started, if your goal is to get better at drums, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Also make sure you click that notification bell so you know exactly when new lessons are dropping. So I recently got an email from one of my students, Wayne Capone up in New York, hey Wayne, and he asked me about this situation where what if you need to play 16th notes with one hand? Now normally when you're playing something fast and up-tempo and you want to get that 16th note vibe, most guys will just double it. That begs the question, what if you want a cross stick? while you do that. Now in that circumstance, you'd have to use one hand. So his question to me was, which technique do I use? Do I just muscle them out? Do I use molar? Or maybe the push-pull technique? And my answer to all three of these questions is yes. That is, you could use any technique. It really depends on the vibe that you're going for, the type of groove that you need to push. Is it a heavier groove? Is it a lighter groove? And you have to factor in all of these things for the music that you're trying to create. Now what you have to understand is that technique, any technique, is a means to an end. The end being creating great music and making it feel good for yourself, the people listening, and the people playing along with you. The more technique you have, the more tools you have in your tool shed to turn around and really express yourself comfortably. So I would argue develop as many tools as you can, even if it's different tools for the same effect, which is kind of what we're talking about here. Now the tempo in question that he specifically asked me about was 110 on the metronome, which is pretty brisk for one hand. I just want to explore what you want to do to develop each of these techniques in a musical or practical situation when you're playing a groove. So let's go ahead and talk about each one, one at a time. Technique number one, muscling it out. So muscling out means that you would do one stroke for one movement, one stroke per 16th note. It's by far the most physical. And I know a lot of guys will argue you don't want to do it that way because it's too physical and too demanding on your muscles. You'll get tired, you'll have no endurance, all that kind of stuff. My answer to that is, that's only true if you don't have the endurance. In fact, if you want to talk about muscling it out, let's talk about any speed or metal player. Blast beats, for the most part, are muscling out. I could say the same thing about any kind of punk style. More recently, the emo style. Guys like Travis Barker. And Trey Cool. But when you do muscle it out like that, when you push every single note, it gives you a certain frantic energy. And that frantic energy could be authentic to the style. Another good example of muscling it out but using dynamics is someone like Stuart Copeland. Now, when you listen to Stewart, so many of his grooves have that frantic energy to it. And a lot of it comes from the fact that he's super physical when he plays. In fact, a lot of times when I see him play, he's wearing gloves. Because he's really digging into those hats because of the way he's physically attacking everything. If you're playing a punk thing, it's going to have a certain vibe if you muscle it out. A blast beat. Same thing. So how do you develop this? The way I do it is old-fashioned working out. But in this situation, the weight doesn't come from the physical weight of the sticks, it comes from the metronome. So what you want to do is start at a slow tempo. I usually start around 60. Then what I do is I play 16th notes, starting with my weak hand, in my case my left, and I keep up with the metronome. I also isolate what technique I'm using. So in this case I'm using my wrist. But you could use your fingers, your wrist and fingers, or just individual fingers. Then I hold that for a solid minute, which since the metronome is counted in beats per minute, it would be 60 counts on the metronome. Then I do the same thing with my right hand. And the same thing, wrist, you can do the fingers, you can do individual fingers, you can do wrist with fingers, a combination. You can even go back and do it with the forearm. There's so many ways you could actually work on this if your form is good and you're nice and relaxed. Then for the third round, I alternate, 30 second notes. So you're still doing 16 notes with either hand, you're just interlocking them. And I hold that for a minute. And that would be the beginning of my chart and what I would consider kind of a warm-up round. You don't want to skip the warm-up. The warm-up is actually very important. Then what I do is move the click up five clicks to 65 and do the whole thing again. Then I move to 70, do it again. Then 75, then 80, 
85, 90, 90 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 130, 135, 140. I generally don't go past 140. Now you may be saying to yourself, those speeds are insane. So how can you possibly hold them for a minute? The answer is, you can't. In fact, I would argue there's few people on the planet that can hold 16 notes with one hand at 140 for a minute. Maybe Buddy Rich could? The best I've ever seen was actually a lesson with Danny Gottlieb when I was in college. He was able to use his left hand in traditional grip and he was able to hold 16 notes at 140 for four measures with one hand and just muscling it out. <laughs> and I'm lucky if I could get four beats at 140. The point is adding the metronome to a higher level adds weight to the exercise. And what's gonna happen is at a certain number as you're counting through, and I advise that you count out loud, you're gonna start falling off that click. And what you want to do is for each hand and alternating, you want to record that number on a chart. So if you're at 100 on the metronome and you start working on left hand, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So I'm at 16, I kind of fell off. That's the number I want to write down. The trick is not to do it with tension. You don't want to be tense when you're doing it. You're not going for high numbers. You're going for a good workout. Staying relaxed and getting a good workout is way more important than whatever number is on your chart. And you're gonna find that these numbers fluctuate daily. They go up, they go down. That happens. Sometimes you have good days, sometimes you have bad days. The trick is not to worry about the number, it's to get a good workout, push yourself, and nurture the habit of doing it. You stick to a chart like this once a day for a month, it's mind-blowing what happens to your hands. Your single strokes will be like out of control. So the end result, if you had done that for a while, that'll look like this. Now that's incredibly fast, and I'm not gonna beat around the bush. That would be really hard to hold for an entire tune. It would take a lot of endurance work. In fact, when I was at my best with endurance, 110 BPM was the last tempo that I was able to do a minute with my left hand, my right hand, and alternating before it started trailing off. And I'm telling you right now, I'm nowhere near that at this point because I just don't do the endurance work like I used to. Should I? Yeah. Do I? Eh. Okay, number two, the molar approach. Now molar's great because molar is the idea of starting momentum with the stick and letting the stick and the bounce and rebound energy carry you through to the next accent. The challenge with molar is you need an accent. The accent is kind of the engine that pushes the rhythm forward. Now, since we're talking about 16th notes, there's two ways to approach this from the molar standpoint. You could do molar fours, which is essentially one accent and three rebounds. Or you could do molar twos, which is one accent and one rebound what some people call the molar pumping motion. And basically if I did that slow, that's a downstroke and an upstroke. When I say molar down, we're talking about a whip stroke because a whip stroke is essentially what molar is built on. Now I'm not gonna go too deep into that because I did talk about molar in the past. So if you wanna go through that, there's a lesson right up here that you could reference. Okay, so let's talk about molar fours. If I just rely completely on the bounce. So that's coming from the fulcrum which is this, and I'm letting that rebound energy just control and getting another whip stroke before the four strokes fade out. It depends on how well you can control the energy that coming from that accent and that whip stroke. The molar four is a whip, tap, tap, up. Whip, tap, tap, up. So in between the whip stroke, you get two bounces for free, which again, allows you to kind of go a little bit faster. It's a little less physical. Less physical also means less control though. Keep that in mind, it's a trade-off. Now notice as I'm pushing that on the hi-hat, I have to add a little finger in there or else it's, it's just gonna sound sloppy. It's gonna be a mess, which again is gonna add some physicality to it. So doing those endurance exercises will actually help this if you work on them both in tandem. So how do you develop the molar exercises? Well, the same way you develop the endurance exercises. You set it on the chart. Let's also talk about molar twos. So the molar two is gonna be the pumping motion that we talked about before. That's gonna be a whip down and then an up, down, up. And basically this dual motion cuts your energy in half. So for every one whip stroke that you can push out, you get one for free on the way up. So sometimes the molar twos will give you a little bit more of a frantic push, kind of like what I was talking about with muscling it out. In fact, a lot of guys like Travis Barker and Trey Cool and guys like that that play this kind of punk emo style, they tend to use a lot of down up pumping motion grooves. 
because you can really dig into it and it still gives you that physical vibe, but half the energy. So the Mola 4 is gonna give you more of a laid back, quarter note pushing vibe, where the Mola 2s is gonna push the time forward a little bit more. So a good example of the Mola 2s would be like Tom Sawyer by Rush. Versus Seven Days by Sting, where Vinny's doing this. And if you're not familiar with either of those guys or those grooves, you should probably quit drums and completely do something else. So let's take a look at the molar twos or the pumping motion at 110, see what that sounds like. All right, now technique number three and the last one that we're going to talk about here. The push-pull technique. What is the push-pull technique? Basically, it's a derivative of the molar twos, of the pumping motion but it's not in your wrist, it's condensed down to your fingers. So I do consider it part of the informal style, which is where the molar style kind of lives. Or any kind of drumming where kinetic energy, meaning the forward momentum created by the rebound of the stick, lets you do the job instead of physicality. So I don't wanna to get too deep into the technique of the push-pull, but it's the idea of letting the stick rebound off the fulcrum, the push, and then letting the stick fall back using gravity the pull, but the goal is to try to create an equilibrium between the two strokes. So they sound even. Now you could also do this in the left hand. And there's a whole bunch of ways of approaching it in traditional grip. You could use more of a drop. And to condense it even further, when I go really fast, just use my index finger and balance it on the fulcrum. As far as the match grip, it's the same as the right hand. But to be honest, I kind of suck at it match grip because I never really sat there and practiced that way. So to develop the push pull. Now you can take the same approach that we talked about earlier where you put it on a chart and you just hold it. The challenge with this is that there's a little bit of a coordination issue with push pull since you're coming down and up on the stick. So one awesome exercise that Frank Bellucci gave me was actually playing an ostinato using the push pull. And it kind of helped you separate between the push and the pull. The ostinato was 1 EN, 2 EN, 3 EN, 4 EN. But you apply the push pull to it. So you would do push pull push, pull push pull, push pull push, pull push pull. That would be your groove or your ostinato on the hi hat. Then you would go through a coordination exercise, like say Gary Chafee's fat back exercises. You put a backbeat on the snare drum. Then you put the bass drum through all the fat back possibilities, which there are 16 of them. It would kind of be like this. One. Then the E. E, N. Three, E, N. Four, E. And then the end. A. Uh. And again, through all the fatback combinations. If you're not familiar with Gary Chafee's fatback exercise, it's part of his Patterns series, and the book is called Time Functioning. Every drummer should own and go through that book. By doing that, it kind of starts making you really aware of the positions, and makes it easier to add different things to the groove while you're keeping that going. So you can do things like a samba. You notice how I use the push-pull to get the fast 16th note vibe on the right hand, but I keep the samba pattern going with the rest of the limbs. There's definitely a coordination issue you need to resolve there. So assuming you work all that out and you get all that together, how's this gonna feel when you're playing with the band? For me, you do sacrifice a little bit of power. So you're not going to get that push that you get with the physicality or with the pumping motion. It's gonna be a little bit more dainty, a little quieter, a little bit tighter. Cool if you're doing like a fast laid back thing. So here's what that groove will sound like if you try it at Wayne's tempo at 110. Three, four. Again, it's a cool vibe, and if you could keep it going, it's really, really hip. So that's gonna wrap up this lesson. And Wayne, thanks so much for writing in with that suggestion because I'm always looking for content for these kind of videos. Now I know there's other ways of doing this. So do you think I missed something or do you have another way of practicing these kind of ideas? I'm always curious to see what other drummers are doing. So if you have a cool solution, definitely let me know in the comments. 
Now, if you feel like you got something out of this lesson, it really helps me out if you give me a like. Remember to subscribe to the channel so you know when new lessons are coming out. I rely on drummers like you to help me spread the word. So feel free, if you know any drummers that you think might glean some benefit from these lessons, go ahead and share it. Thanks again for checking out the lesson. I'll see you next time. Practice with purpose.